Graham, and good morning, my dear brothers and sisters, as we meet around the emblems of our Lord once more. I could ask you to have your Bibles open in Second Chronicles chapters 28 and 29. We'll just take a couple of verses to set our minds for what we're going to speak about this morning. And we'll pick up the record in Second Chronicles chapter 28 and at verse 24. And Ahaz gathered together the vessels of the house of God and cut in pieces the vessels of the house of God and shut up the doors of the house of Yahweh and he made him altars in every corner of Jerusalem. And every several city of Judah made he high places to burn incense unto other gods and provoke to anger Yahweh, God of his fathers. Now the rest of his acts and all his ways, first and last, behold, they are written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. And they had slept with his fathers, and they buried him in the city, even in Jerusalem. But they brought him not into the sepulchres of the kings of Israel. And Hezekiah, his son, reigned in his stead. And Hezekiah began to reign when he was five and twenty years old, and he reigned nine and twenty years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did that which was right in the sight of Yahweh, according to all that David, his father, had done. And he, in the first year of his reign, in the first month, opened the doors of the house of Yahweh and repaired them. And for 16 long years, brothers and sisters, Ahaz had done things his own way, to the point of cutting in pieces the vessels of the house of Yahweh. And further than that, he shut the doors to the house of Yahweh and made altars in every corner of Jerusalem and set up high places in several cities of Judah to burn incense to other gods. And in doing so, he provoked the God of Israel to anger. You see, Ahaz had effectively shut out all forms of worship as required by God. And the shutting of the doors to the temple was the ultimate act of defiance, as it meant now he could really do things his own way. And we know that Ahaz's end came and he wasn't even buried in Jerusalem. And, sorry, in the sepulchres of the father. And then the record turns dramatically with the story of Hezekiah. And we read of this young man who, due to the influence of his mother, at the age of 25, did that which was right in the sight of Yahweh, as his father David did. And the very first act that's recorded of Hezekiah is the opening of the doors to the temple and the repairing of those doors. And this little story here of the closing and the opening of doors got me wondering as to the significance of doors in the record of Scripture. It's very, very evident from these two stories that they're not actually about the actual doors, but what is represented by them. We know very well that God does not dwell in temples made by man. But the lesson of a congregational need for people to meet somewhere cannot be overlooked. And that's what happened. The shutting of the doors to the temple meant that there was no longer a responsibility to meet. And the minute there's no responsibility to meet, the accountability to one another comes to an end, does it not? You see, and Ahaz quickly went about setting things up in his own way. You see, in Jerusalem at this point, you could quickly run to your nearest altar, which was just at your street corner. And it didn't take too much time out of your day. You could quickly get it out the way. You see, and the problem is identified by Hezekiah when he says, that they had turned their faces from the habitation of Yahweh and had turned their back. And that's what they had done. They had turned their backs on God and they turned their faces away from the things of God. Dedication to the things of God had all but gone from the kingdom of Judah. And so the act in verse 3 of Second Chronicles chapter 29 is the enormous task of Hezekiah opening the hearts of men and women to the things of God again. 
And the repairing of the doors was the act of getting them to turn their face against, again to Yahweh and to turn their backs on the false gods that Ahaz had made them worship. And the chapter that Brother David read for this morning is full of detail as to how Hezekiah went about bringing the things back into line that were good and acceptable and right before God. And in verse 11, he says, My sons, be not now negligent, for Yahweh hath chosen you to stand before him, to serve him, that he should minister unto him and burn incense. And so Hezekiah focuses the people again on the things that matter. He focuses them on Yahweh, that we should serve him and minister unto him. And that's our responsibility, is it not? And then in fifth, verse 15, and they gathered their brethren and sanctified themselves and came according to the commandment of the king by the words of, the, of Yahweh to cleanse the house of Yahweh. And so there was a need for the cleansing of the temple and things had to be set back in order. And everything was done according to the correct ways. And at the end of the chapter, we see that this was done suddenly. So this was an urgent action on the part of, of Hezekiah. And when you enter the record and you, you just read what's happening here, it's remarkable that a young, young man of 25 could achieve all this. And... The lesson from that, brothers and sisters, is that there is a point in everybody's life when there are things that need urgent attention, is there not? And I was thinking about this in, in our context, brothers and sisters. There was a time recently when the doors of all our ecclesias around the world were closed, forced on us by governments reacting to contain the virus. And this caused things to change in the way things are being done. And we all had to adjust certain things and had to come to terms with what was going on. But the word is asking us, brothers and sisters, to consider whether or not the doors to our house need to be repaired. And it's a question that we should always be asking. It's not just because of the circumstances, but there is always a need to go through the motions of considering whether or not what we're doing is right and acceptable before God. And, and Israel and Judah in particular faltered under Ahaz, and Hezekiah brought them back. You see, the fact is that as a collective, as brothers and sisters of this ecclesia to which we belong and any other ecclesias that are listening this morning, um, we have a, an, an honest assessment to do to ask if there's room for improvement. And if you spend five minutes chatting to Brother Graham and see how difficult it is sometimes to keep the ecclesial program together, there is definitely a need for us to, to draw our attention to our duties and our responsibilities to those. Because the core function of the ecclesia, brothers and sisters, is to make sure that there is a people prepared to meet the Lord. And when things work together in the ecclesia, they work for the good of the body. And we've just recently been reading the Acts of the Apostles. And in Acts chapter 2, we are reminded of the, the core principles by which we ought to be living. That they continued steadfastly in the Apostles' doctrine, in fellowship, in breaking of bread and prayer. And this they did with one accord, with gladness and singleness of heart. You see, in the early Ecclesia, brothers and sisters, there was a dedicated focus to the things of God. And we'll see a bit later um, in the exhortation if there's room for improvement in that regard in our lives, or is the age in which we're living dulling our senses? So in the context of ourselves and our own lives, it's always right and good to ask if we could be doing better. And the lesson is indeed powerful to us from what we read. You see, because when we consider the lesson of doors and other parts of scripture, brothers and sisters, we learn many wonderful things. Come to John chapter 10 with me, please. In John chapter 10, we read that the Lord Jesus Christ is the door. 
in verse 7. Let's just pick up the record in John 10 and chapter, and sorry, in John 10, verse 7. And Jesus said unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. And all that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, and the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is in hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth. And the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. And the hireling fleeth because he is in hireling and careth not for the sheep. And I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. As the father knoweth me, even so know I the father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And the Lord Jesus Christ is saying that he is the door. He is the one through whom we enter into the things of salvation. It's how we come to the Father. It's through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when we speak about the repairing of our doors, we do it in the context of what's been done for us. You see, we have accepted the work of our Lord Jesus Christ in baptism. And the immediate lesson is that the principles of everything that we are about are found in him. And we remember him today as the good shepherd, the one who would lay down his life for the sheep so that they may be saved. And during the Exodus, we know that they had to paint the post and the lintel of their doors with blood of the lamb so that the angel would pass over those homes as the families were safe behind the doors of their home. And there is an interesting thing to learn when you see what happened, especially in the account of the Exodus, that the, the work of the truth began in the home. In Exodus chapter 33, um, when the, the cloud came during the day, it stood at the, at the, at the door to the tabernacle. And it says that the, the men of Israel stood in the doors of their tents and worshipped God. And so there is, a, there is a need for us to also look at the doors of our own hearts in this regard and see if there's repairing that is needed there. Because it's important to understand it in that context. Because here we are just a collection of, of individuals. So in order for there to be effective repairing here, it needs to happen at home first, does it not? And I think that lesson is very clear from the, from the story of Exodus in particular, that it began in the home. With the, with the Passover, everybody had to be prepared in their own home. Without that personal preparation, there would have been no collective salvation. And when it comes to these things, and it comes to the word of God, the Lord Jesus Christ says to us in Matthew chapter 7, in the Sermon on the Mount, that we are to ask, we are to knock. He says in verse 7, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and he shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh, receiveth, and he that seeketh, findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. And sometimes we, we tend to think that we knock on the door once to find out what things are about. But the Lord Jesus Christ is telling us that there needs to be a continual knocking at the door. There needs to be a continual seeking of the things of God, to learn from him, to ask from him. You see, because if we ask and we seek and we knock, it will be opened to us, brothers and sisters. And that's our responsibility in the matters of the truth. And so we live in, in the last days before the Lord Jesus Christ. And I don't know... Um, what it's like for you, but I'm sure we're all in the same boat. It seems that weariness is creeping into our bones. And in Revelation chapter 3, we have the final letter to the Laodiceans, in which the rebuke was that they were lukewarm. They were neither hot or cold. 
And can we just come to uh, the letter in, in, in Revelation chapter three? Because there is a, a very interesting little cameo that plays itself out here in what the Lord Jesus Christ says to the Laodiceans. Now, it's often been said that the letter to the Laodiceans is the lesson for the ecclesia in the last days. And the Lord Jesus Christ says here in verse 15, I know thy works, thou art neither cold nor hot, I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not thou that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. You see, here was an ecclesia, brothers and sisters, that were not attending to the need of repairing the doors. They thought they were fine. And the lesson of the Laodiceans is that there is no room for mediocre service in our Lord's vineyard. We bring the best in service to our Lord Jesus Christ to our heavenly Father. For his advice in verse 18 is, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. And the lessons of the Laodicean Ecclesia, brothers and sisters, is that the Lord Jesus Christ is asking us to buy gold from him and to take the raiment from him. And in doing those things, brothers and sisters, the lukewarmness disappears because we grab hold of things eternal. And in verse 20, we read, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will hear my voice and open the door, I will sup into him and will sup with him and he with me. And verse 20, brothers and sisters, is a verse that's really powerful because it's the antidote to mediocrity. It's the antidote to the weariness that we feel. Because the Lord Jesus Christ is knocking at our door. He's wanting us to open the door. He desires to sup with us. And when we are weighed down heavily by the things of this age, we leave that door closed sometimes, don't we? And in the letter here, we're being asked to, over, to open that door. See, in verse 21, to him that overcometh. Unless we open that door, we will never overcome is the lesson that we're learning from the Laodiceans. And it's, it's important that we, we meditate on these things. And the lesson of the door is highlighted for us further because it actually means that there will come a moment when opportunity comes to an end. In the story of the, of the ark, 120 years Noah preached. And when Noah and his family were on the ark, the door was closed. Opportunity was over. This morning with Brother Michael, we looked at the parable of the, of the uh, ten virgins. And we, we know from the parable in Matthew chapter 25 that all ten virgins went out to meet the Lord. It appears that the five foolish virgins decided that they didn't need to take oil and did things their own way. But in Matthew chapter 25, we read that they all slumbered and slept as the Lord tarried. So even the wise virgins had fallen asleep. But the, the wise virgins, brothers and sisters, had enough oil in their lamps. They had bought that gold and they had taken on that raiment that Christ encouraged. And they were ready then when the cry came. And they, as a result, were ready to enter into the marriage. And then we read the door was shut. The time of opportunity was over. And we need to understand that these things are important in our context. And coupled with what the Lord Jesus Christ says in Matthew 25, he says to the disciples in verse 13 that there is a need to watch. We need to be watchmen for each other, brothers and sisters. We need to see each other in the light of the word and encourage one another. We spoke about that this morning as well in the Bible class. There is a dire need to build each other up 
in the things that we believe, brothers and sisters. We cannot have borne the heat of the day only to let it fail now. You see, the lesson about lukewarmness is highlighted by the Lord Jesus Christ in Luke 21 when he identifies the cares of this life as the things that will make us falter. And the things of this life, brothers and sisters, are difficult at the moment. We're all struggling to make ends meet. But we need to trust that God is in control and that God has promised us daily bread. And one of the things that I've noticed recently, and it's probably, a, it's probably a, um, my own issue, is but the longer that the Lord doesn't return, it appears that the excitement of the prophetical word is getting lost. It seems that we see things happening over and over again, and then they stop. It, we had Brexit and then sort of fizzled, and then Russia invaded Ukraine, and it fizzled. And, and it, it tends to be that we watch the current events, and then nothing seems to happen. And I'm afraid, brothers and sisters, that that happens when we place too much emphasis on the interpretation of current events. When we move away from looking to the foundational principles, that happens. But we do have a sure word of prophecy and things are working out in God's timetable. And the lesson of, of, of seeing the things of God through the eye of faith are very important. We're in Revelation chapter three, if you still got your Bibles open there, and let's just come to chapter four of Revelation, chapters four and five. You see, we often speak about having a vision of the kingdom to come, but what does that really mean for each one of us, brothers and sisters? Is it a vision of what, it's, what we're going to be doing or, or the activities that we're going to be involved in? Well, I think it's more than that. You see, in chapter four and five, we, we have the, the vision of the kingdom that's revealed to John, the kingdom established. And he says in verse chapter four, verse one, after this, I looked and behold, the door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me and said, come up hither. I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And so brothers and sisters, when we look through this door of heaven, with John, we see the things of the kingdom established. And what do we see? We see the worthy one enthroned with all power and glory. We see the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who we come to remember this morning, who's overcome the things of the flesh, seated in all glory and praise and honor being given to him. Verse 11 of chapter 4, thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. And there's the vision that we want, brothers and sisters. We want to see our glorified Lord. And then in chapter 5, verse 9, they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book, and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by the blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And the vision, brothers and sisters, is coupled entirely to the Lord Jesus Christ, that we may be there with him in that day as kings and priests. All the other detail that comes out that needs to happen in the kingdom and will be taken care of when we're there. And I beheld in verse 11, and I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne of the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them and heard our saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. And, and what a glorious picture is presented to us, brothers and sisters, of that day. Of our Lord Jesus Christ, the worthy one, 
surrounded by his saints. And we can only but look forward to that moment when, with all the faithful of all, we shall be there. And so this morning, brothers and sisters, as we come to remember the worthy one, the one who burst forth from the door of the tomb with his resurrection after the stone had been rolled away, has opened up for us the way of life. He's won the victory so that we may be victors. And so as we consider our lives in the context of his, let us do the repairing of the doors that is necessary because we remember him as the door by which we enter. Let us knock and seek and ask. And more than that, brothers and sisters, this morning, let us hear him knocking at the door as we see him as the good shepherd who laid down his life for the sheep.